this is the evolution of, of psychiatry and mental health. It's psychedelic, period. So we have a very special guest with us on the first episode. We have Zappy Zappelin, the Chief Visionary Officer at Psychoceutical. Zappy is a well-known futurist, entrepreneur, and award-winning documentary filmmaker. Playboy magazine called him the man who wants to change the world with psychedelics. He is considered one of the foremost experts in psychedelic therapies and companies. Zappi is often called on as a psychedelic concierge to help celebrities and business icons have a conscious transformation. Known as a visionary and investment guru, Zappi has been spotting trends for decades, such as internet domain names, legal CBD and cannabis, and now the burgeoning psychedelic economy. Zappi also founded the Mind Army, a nonprofit that's fighting for the right to pursue happiness. The Mind Army is demanding legalization right now to combat the mental health and addiction crisis. So Zappi, super, super excited to have you on the show today. Great to be here. Wow, what a time we're living in, you know, to see this post-pandemic moment happen where kind of the silver lining on the pandemic is everybody's tuned into really thinking about their mental health and coming up with you know, new solutions, old solutions that are different than what we were doing before that. It's just so refreshing to see it. And then to see all the people being positively affected already from the psychedelic renaissance, it's really like a great time to be alive. Oh, you got that right. I mean, the fields of psychiatry and mental health treatment, I feel like have been so stagnant for so, you know, so many decades now, where now we're finally starting to see some of these, you know, new, but also very old technologies come back into play and really powerfully impact people's lives. So you, you hit the nail on the head. It is such an exciting time to be alive. I want to yeah. hear a little... I want to hear a little about you, Zappy, in terms of your journey. How did you originally get interested in psychedelics? How did you then eventually become this psychedelic concierge, which I would love to, you know, if you could actually define that for the listeners too. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a great job. And I, what I love about it is there's an unlimited opportunity for other people to become psychedelic concierges. And, you know, what happened to me was an organic story of, you know, going through the American life and trying to live the American dream and chasing after, uh, you know, going to school and getting a job, making money, having a family. They told you, like, when you do that, you're going to be totally fulfilled. And I had some really great successes and things. But in 2010, I was sitting there and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm happy, but I'm not totally fulfilled and I don't even know what I'm doing here. So if I got to really figure that out and it was like a spiritual midlife crisis is what I call it. And I remember back to when I was younger, a teenager, and I had this incredible psychedelic experience where at, when I took the psychedelics, I looked at my hand and it was trillions of atoms and they were just vibrating at this certain frequency. And then I looked over at my friend and he was the exact same atoms, just a slightly different frequency than me and I was like oh wow I looked at the table same atoms different frequency I was like oh my god everything's frequency I can never unsee this like this is an incredible aspect that our five senses aren't tuned into and I remember back to that in this crisis moment where I thought well you know maybe I got to go back inside of myself to get some of these answers clearly it's not in what they told me of you know, exterior and physical things, I'm going to have to go back. And I had seen that people were going down to Peru, sitting with shamans. And I've always had uh, some part, you know, I worked on Wall Street early in my career, but I wound up getting into the infomercial industry and production. So I always had a, a film crew around. And when I decided I was going to go into the jungle and try ayahuasca, San Pedro, and sit with a shaman in 2010, uh, I wanted to bring, you know, my film equipment with me and pe bring people. And I was lucky enough to get Michelle Rodriguez, the actress from Fast and Furious. And, and we went down to Peru and we sat with the shamans and had you know, incredible life changing experiences. And when I came back, I just sort of followed myself and Michelle Rodriguez for a couple of years, saw how we integrated our experience in the jungle into what was happening in our lives 
And we put the movie out in 2016. It's been a phenomenon, the reality of truth. Michelle Rodriguez is so good in that movie. And we've, it's now been seen over 15 million times. And uh, it's said to have caused over a million people to do a psychedelic experience, to have that experience, to feel the comfort to do it. And so that's a real honor. If anybody hasn't seen it, it's available on Amazon Prime and YouTube. It won the Amsterdam Film Festival in 2016. So I definitely recommend seeing it. Michelle will inspire you to go you know, have your journey. And then what was happening for me organically was I was just going around, sell, um, you know, showing the movie and screening it. And somebody came up to me after one of the screenings and they said, hey, I'm friends with Lamar Odom, the basketball player, Kardashian. Uh, he's not in a great place right now. Would you be willing to talk to him about plant medicine and psychedelics and stuff? So I said, absolutely. And I wound up getting to talk to Lamar a few years ago and tell him, about the opportunity within psychedelics, given that he was, you know, prone to anxiety and uh, had uh, has addiction in his, you know, profile, and so he wound up uh, trusting me and allowing me to film that experience where I brought him to do some ketamine treatments, which was a mind blower for him because he'd never had any psychedelic experiences, always been told to stay away, that it was in fact dangerous because as an African American man you know, if something had happened and, you know, it didn't go well, he could be shot by the police or arrested or put in a mental institution, just like important, you know, things for us all now to think about as psychedelics come out, how do we make this inclusive of everyone so that, you know, everybody can get the benefits. And, but for Lamar, it was really amazing because he, you know, went inside himself, started to get more confidence, felt like he was building up his neural connections because he had had 12 strokes and six heart attacks when he overdosed um, and was in a coma. And so what happened was uh, once he trusted myself and the medicine more, uh, he wound up coming down to Mexico to be with a doctor down there that does ibogaine treatments. Ibogaine is an African root that can break even a heroin or opiate uh, alcohol addiction, to two packs of cigarettes, gambling, whatever it is, it can break it in one, you know, 12 to 24 hour session. And as soon as Lamar had it, he just sort of popped. It was like a reset. He just kind of popped back into his physical strength and his mental strength. And you'll see it in the movie, Lamar Odom Reborn, which is now on Amazon. He said he felt so good that he thought he could come back and perfect. He was like, yeah, no, I know what I got to do. I'm going to go do it. And he just trained for six months. Nobody else motivating him. He wound up playing in a professional game in Dubai. It was like his personal Rocky moment. And, uh, you know, for him to be able to, in the Ibogaine, you know, visit his mother with his mother who passed away when he was 12 years old and see his son who died at six months of old age, see him grow. Those experiences within the Ibogaine completely changed him, took away his fear of death, gave him a renewed um, vigor for living his life and um, family and all that kind of stuff. So I'm excited for people to see him in the movie because He's like Michelle Rodriguez, he's super inspirational and you can see how their energy actually changes throughout. So I'm, you know, just really blessed to have been able to have a couple of people in these, you know, celebrities who are willing to let the camera be turned on them in these psychedelic experiences, which is very rare because I, you know, obviously I have a lot of other psychedelic, you know, uh, celebrity clients, but, you know, they want their privacy and, you know, even myself, if somebody said, hey, I'm going to turn a camera on your first psychedelic experience, I probably would be like, no, thank you. You know, who knows what's going to happen. But the reality is both these people knew that they were, you know, working with people like myself and professionals and shamans and doctors that were, you know, all had the best intent. So they felt, you know, fully comfortable that it was going to be a good experience. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just honored to be here in a time where these things are being respected 
you know, you know, we talk about psychology and psychiatry and things like that. And these were extremely promising uh, compounds and technologies back in the 50s for psychiatry. And they were, things were going incredibly well with LSD. And, you know, of course, in that time, you had everything happen with Vietnam and the counterculture. You had the uh, pharmaceutical companies who were bringing out their antidepressants, their SSRIs at that time, didn't want competition necessarily. And lastly, unfortunately, because this is really the roadblock, is you had the alcohol companies who made it extremely difficult for psychedelics because they realized that these were going to replace alcohol and also that you could break an addiction from alcohol, which isn't good for their bottom line either. So uh, apparently, and you know, again, just speculation, but I've been told that really it was the alcohol companies that got in the way. The pharmaceutical companies would have been fine integrating these things years and years ago. And you know, I always say from the medical establishment standpoint, and this is the most important thing to realize, doctors, you know, really, for the most part, don't even know about nutrition, which could solve, you know, 80% of the things that they're working on. So why would we think they know about psychedelics? They don't. And it's our job as the psychonauts to, you know, share this information, this knowledge, and not wait around for them to, you know, get with it. So uh, a really important time for everybody, you know, watching this. We're so early to, uh, you know, take a stand and uh, join something like my mind army where we're fighting for the right to pursue happiness. And we want these things available. We want them descheduled. We want them rescheduled, like whatever's the fastest steps for us to be able to study and for people to access these. We think that during this post pandemic crisis of, you know, suicide, addiction, depression. Uh, we need these tools to, you know, support people. And we're not going to sit here in 2022 and have people tell us that alcohol is good, tobacco is good, but somehow psilocybin mushrooms, those are bad and they're off the table, even if your family's in crisis. We're calling bullshit on that. And um, amen. Yeah. Yeah. The science definitely says otherwise. It's It's pretty conclusive at this point. So, Certainly, I agree with you on that. Zappy, what, what have you found, you know, when it when it comes to clients maybe that you've worked with or people that you talk to who, who maybe feel a bit apprehensive about the idea of trying a psychedelic? Maybe they've they've sort of still been in the dogma of, you know, prohibition and and being told that, you know, taking acid is going to permanently change their chromosomes and all this other, you know, crazy yeah, stuff yeah. That, that we heard that was really just a lot of sort of... Uh, you know, bullshit, frankly, but um, yeah. what, what, you know, how do you sort of build trust and, and sort of open people up to having these really amazing experiences with psychedelics? Yeah, I'm going to say it's very important you find somebody that can guide you because set and setting, meaning who you're sitting there with and the environment you're in, those are very important to having a, a good, ex not only a good experience, but to get the most out of it that you could. So it's very important to do these things in the right set setting with the right people. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, the fact that millions of people have done psilocybin mushrooms, many with great benefit, uh, you know, psilocybin, you know, is, and all of these psychedelics are completely non-addictive. That's been proven at, you know, everywhere from Yale and Johns Hopkins. These are non-addictive and they have huge medical benefit. And I would say, you know, you have to listen to the science that's coming out from community, not from the medical establishment, because again, they don't know about this stuff. So it's important that you're getting your information and you're being guided properly. Number one thing I would say is the best thing to do if you're thinking about it is to either is to kind of ease your way in. So microdosing is in a tremendous way to, for people to ease their way in because you can take a sub perceptual amount of something and you're not going to be having some experience. It's meant to really be sub perceptual, but you can get a feeling for how it is for you before you consider maybe doing a larger dose and having some macro type experience that could be life changing. But the, the, you know, the psilocybin microdosing, I'm predicting that in the next few years, 
Those replace all the antidepressants out there. Everyone I know that takes them feels incredible, um, feels more creative, less anxiety. And, you know, you're talking about like, you know, two, three dollars worth of compound. This is this is naturally, you know, uh, given to us here. So, you know, unfortunately, these things have been underground and taboo. And there's been a lot of, like I said, the alcohol companies and folks you know, causing problems for the reputation. But at the end of the day, these are incredibly safe. Um, and I would say that, you know, ketamine is another one. It's FDA approved. You go to a doctor's office, you're overseen by a medical person, and you get to have this very powerful experience without, you know, having to go to the jungle or trusting a friend or something like that. Um, and so I think that's an extremely viable option. Ketamine, number one side effect of medical ketamine is that it breaks suicidal ideation. So suicidal thoughts are broken with ketamine. So we have such an epidemic right now of people who are, you know, committing suicide, thinking about it, uh, you know, contemplating or dealing with somebody else who has and what the ramifications. It's a very terrifying thing. And if we have ketamine that's shown to be 70 plus percent effective against even treatment resistant depression, then we have to take it really, really serious. This has to be the first line of defense. So before you take antidepressants, before you go into, you know, uh, talk therapy, before you do all these things, you should try a ketamine treatment because they've shown that when the ketamine, um, there's new science from Nature, Ma that's in Nature Magazine. You have this area of your brain called the default mode network that a lot of people have heard about but there's a mechanism in there called your lateral habenula. And that lateral habenula is recording all the stress you've ever had in your whole life. When it becomes too much, it puts your brain into burst mode. And when your brain's in burst mode, you get no dopamine, no at all. So that's your happiness, your motivation. And so the first time you do this medical ketamine, it takes your brain out of burst mode and you immediately start getting your dopamine back. So you know, we get this great phone call all the time the day after from the wife or the husband or partner or whatnot. And they'll be like, oh my God, he just cleaned the garage. You know, he's been claiming he's going to do that for five years, whatever you're doing, keep going. But really that person's brain was in burst mode. And then they start to, you know, want to live again. They're getting dopamine and they're, you know, having an expanded consciousness uh, experience. So this is really powerful. I think ketamine and psilocybin micro doses uh, probably going to replace everything else. Uh, there's studies with psilocybin for alcohol reduction. There's, um, you know, all kinds of uh, PTSD studies going on now with ketamine. And then we have ibogaine, of course, like I talked about with Lamar. It's been three years. Lamar told me, you know, since that ibogaine treatment, he has not used any hard drugs. And he said that, you know, when Kobe Bryant died, he knew the addict in him knew that he could get away with using that day and everybody would let him off the hook. And he's like, I just didn't have the desire. And he's like, I, if something happened in that ibogaine, I just didn't have the desire that day. And so, you know, that you can't do that with talk therapy. You can't do that with cannabis. You can't do that with SSR. And so there's nothing else. We have psychedelics. And, you know, in this moment where I think, we're living in it. We're having an empathy crisis right now where people are having a hard time feeling empathy, putting themselves in other people's shoes. Doesn't mean you don't want to care or something, but you can't empathize to the point where or empathy is they have a near death experience or they have a major psychedelic breakthrough. And so if we can use these psychedelics to raise empathy and get a critical mass of people raised up, you know, we could basically solve any problem we have as a society really easily. I love how you think about it on such a big scale, because I completely agree. If we can collectively, if we can start by changing each individual's brain and clearing out the trauma, increasing happiness and joy, and we spread that, you know, to collectively, uh, you know, to families, to societies at large. I mean, just think the changes that are possible within this world. Think about how many problems, you know, I encourage the listeners to think about the problems that we could potentially solve with that. And I love yeah. the, 
I love the point you brought up too about, you know, ketamine's ability to, to really reduce suicidal ideation. I mean, it's, it seems like it could be so important for, you know, people that are on the verge of suicide to have access to like ketamine infusions, you know, right? Because at, we know SSRIs, yeah. antidepressants, they take weeks to even start working, even if they do work. A lot of times for right. people, they don't work. You know, this could really be saving lives. I mean, it is saving lives, but I think as it expands, as the uses expand, I'd, I'd love to see it, you know, ketamine just be able to be in like psychiatric hospitals or emergency rooms, right? Where someone comes in yes. and, and they're close to ending their lives and they get a ketamine infusion and maybe that can really help them flip the script really quickly. Yeah, no, I think that that is absolutely the reality of our future. And psychedelics are quite literally the cure for everything, because if you don't raise people's empathy, they're not going to be thinking about things like, oh, what about the person on the other side of the world? What about water in 50 years? Like, let's talk about that, figure that out, you know, so we have to get this, you know, even war, you know, when I see the war in Ukraine and Russia, not even taking sides, I just say, oh, wow, like we got to get like a million doses of ketamine over to Ukraine or to Poland, because these people who've been displaced, they are having trauma, PTSD, they, they're in burst mode, I'm sure, and we have to help these people. Rather, if we help their minds, then they're going to be able to, you know, do the right thing uh, when it's over, be able to go back in a good place and react and, you know, be a positive force. So, yeah, I think you know, there's no subject that will not be upgraded with the psychedelic renaissance right now. And just like when, you know, psychedelics hit in the 60s, they changed everything, music, fashion, all these things. And that's happening now, too. I'm starting to see it in the hip hop community. It's, start, it's about to raise consciousness in the hip hop community, the music, the art, the business models, uh, all of these things, it's going to be really incredible to see because in the 60s, when it got shut down, that was because there was only really, you know, a very small group of people controlling the media. You had, you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS, uh, a few major newspapers that said, so if they want to shut something down, they could. Now, with the internet, social media, you know, people are hip to the fact that not only are these things uh, working and safe, but this is the new norm they're already being, you know, realizing. And I think I have to take my hat off to cannabis too, because um, cannabis really laid the foundation. And by that, what I mean is for people like my mom's generation, she's in her early eighties and she'd always been told, you know, don't do drugs, you know, don't smoke marijuana. She always told me that. And I was always like, well, you know, I'm going to like, I'm following the Grateful Dead around. So like, I'm probably <laughs> going to do some drugs, but you know, thanks anyways. And, um, but you know, she, she just always had that in her head. And so about, you know, three or four years ago when cannabis became legal in Massachusetts, she went to the dispensary, she got some gummies and she took them and she was like, wow, this is like really good for my joints and for my arthritis, all this stuff. And so when psychedelics came along and an opportunity to microdose or to be, you know, somewhere like Colorado or she's like, just, yeah, give me the microdose. Like they probably lied to me about that too. So I think people have realized because of cannabis coming out, like it is that, you know, what we've been told is not the truth and we have to explore it for ourselves. Right. Right. When we were convinced for so long that, you know, a plant that has all of these amazing chemicals, these cannabinoids that are so healing, you know, in terms of reducing pain and some being good for sleep and improving mood and anxiety, all of these different things. And they work in synergy, you know, the entourage effect, it's an unbelievably awesome plant. And we were just completely sold a lie, you know, for the longest time. So I think you're absolutely right that that people's shifting attitudes towards cannabis. And as we've seen more and more states legalize cannabis, that probably really has done a lot to shift people's perceptions to say, hey, I wonder, I wonder what else we're being lied to about. And that, yes. you know, that being psychedelics. Yeah. And when, you know, we're in this golden moment, you know, I've been early in the domain name and internet space where you know, the internet came along, that's a trillion dollar industry, you know, biotech in the 90s, another trillion dollar industry. 
And here we are, you know, cryptocurrency, another one, but here we are with psychedelic medicine. This is about to be a trillion dollar industry. It's going to take over, uh, you know, everything from pain medication to uh, mental health, to addiction, to peak performance, all these things. So it's, it's so huge. When you get one of those, you just got to be, you know, you just want to find good companies to be involved with. I just started something called Zappy Times. You can go to zappytimes.com, but it's basically a newsletter putting out information coming up about uh, the different companies that you can invest in the space, the ones that I'm associated with. So definitely don't check it out if you are concerned about a conflict of interest or something. These are companies that I like. These are not just like, you know, giant global corps that I have no, you know, ability to affect. But the things that I love, you know, I'm involved with a company called Psychoceutical. We've got these patents that work in the pharmaceutical space that we've licensed for psychedelics. It basically solves the whole dosing problem for the whole industry. And we've created like a coopetition model where we want other companies to work with our delivery techniques and it'll allow them to give less medication, get more bioavailability, avoid the stomach and the liver, um, all those side effects associated. And if we want with one some of our patents, we can actually take out the psychedelic experience itself, uh, but still get all the neurogenetic benefits. So for example, ketamine, every time you do ketamine, when it metabolizes, it turns into this hydroxynorketamine, which builds new neural pathways in your brain. So it's basically building your brain up. So the opportunity for you know, with our patents where you take a topical, psychoceutical got a patent where you put a topical at the back of the neck at the base of the hairline, right there, the ketamine, the other psychedelics, they go directly to the nerve tissue, directly to the brain, and they don't go into your liver and your stomach and all that. They bypass that, they go directly. So you don't have the psychedelic effect, but you get the benefit, which opens it up to children, the elderly, maybe people are afraid, they don't want to have some kind of experience, but they want the benefit. This is like the time we're living in. It's like so exciting. And, um, you know, I just look at the companies that are in this space right now. And I think about somebody watching this podcast right now. If you're watching this podcast in late 2022, early 2023, you are in the top 0.001% of the public that's in the know about the opportunity and you can own some of these companies uh, very cost effectively. And these are gonna be like owning the pharma companies in the 1920s, biotech companies in the 1990s, just owning a few of them with a little bit of money could fund your entire retirement right now. So great time to be a, an investor and participative if you're a psychonaut, uh, just like in the early cannabis days or the early domain names or opportunities that you can make, you know, fortunes just uh, by being early and buying some good stuff. That's incredible. There's, there's opportunities out there. And I, I wanted to highlight, you know, I think, I think that delivery system that Psychoceutical is able to, uh, to deliver, you know, that's, that could be so impactful in terms of like, you know, there, there are some cases say like, you know, with schizophrenia where psychedelic use is, is not necessarily encouraged because that could worsen someone's, someone's symptoms if they, you know, have, have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, or, you know, you think about like, you know, children, you know, young kids who are suffering from different, you know, mental health, neurological disorders, but they could use that, those neuroplastic neurogenesis effects of psychedelics like ketamine without producing the actual, you know, full-blown psychedelic experience. I mean, that could be so powerful for people who, who psychedelics yeah. might, you know, a classic psychedelic might not be the right fit for. Yeah, there's no question. And even, you know, to the comment about schizophrenia, um, you know, again, I think there's just more research that's needed. I've actually seen people who are schizophrenic do very well with ketamine, do very well with things like ibogaine. And it's just a little bit more, you know, something that, you know, in general, they suggested, you know, like right. maybe don't. But in reality, these are the things that are going to fix those disorders. And so we have this opportunity, you know, I think we have to get these things rescheduled so they can be studied properly. Because right now we've got this situation where, you know, it's like a peanut allergy, okay? There's certain people who should not be taking different compounds and we have to know who they are. 
just like a peanut allergy, we don't say no one can eat peanuts anymore. We just have to have proper resources dedicated to R&D and you know, we'll know perfectly well what's best because all of these psychedelic compounds have a different benefit to them. You know, again, ibogaine for addiction, uh, San Pedro, cactus, if you're disconnected with nature, immediately connect you. Psilocybin microdosing, mushroom microdosing, if you're you know, not experiencing joy on a daily basis. Uh, all these things have these different attributes. And if we understand them uh, even better, then we can make real recommendations about dosing and who it's appropriate for and not. Uh, I think we'll be very surprised looking back. I think some of these things where, you know, at one point or another, somebody, you know, said, you know, maybe you shouldn't use it for this or that, uh, that may be contradicted. Um, and so, you know, I know uh, I, I think there's a great opportunity for um, a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists to be guiding people uh, who are having a psychedelic experience, but I think it's very important that they have the psychedelic experience themselves to be of any real benefit to these people. So if you, you know, and this is where, again, the psychedelic concierge, and I wanted to just explain that, but it's not much different than a psychedelic, uh, and then a concierge at a hotel, you know, you go to the concierge and you say, hey, where should we eat dinner tonight? And they ask you a series of questions and they say, you know, what kind of food do you like? Do you want music? Do you like wine, indoor, outdoor? And then they recommend a place. Well, with a psychedelic concierge, what you're doing is you're asking the person, you know, what is your intent for doing this? And what are your traumas? And when they tell you that, then you can create uh, either, you know, an opportunity or a, you know, in the case of Lamar, it was a formula that I created him for him to create a conscious transformation. So in his case, it was ketamine, plus plant medicine, plus a daily practice of breathing, meditation, that equals a conscious transformation. So if you know that somebody has, you know, is experiencing something, some kind of trauma or did, and they're trying to overcome something, then a psychedelic concierge can make a really good recommendation. And so I'm looking forward, I'm putting together like a psychedelic concierge course for people to be psychedelic concierges, to know what to do and understand that. But absolutely critical, if you haven't done the compound yourself, you're not going to be doing the person a service by trying to, um, you know, coach them or guide them after the fact. Because the reality is that 50% of the benefit comes after your psychedelic experience when you integrate that back into your life. And if you're not doing that with somebody who has an appreciation for maybe expanded consciousness or the language of those psychedelic compounds, you know, after, you know, cause I've seen it happen before where, you know, after a ketamine treatment uh, and somebody's, you know, out of birth mode and they want to live their life. And they're not, if you were to say to them, Oh, tell me about, you know, what happened with your mother 30 years ago, they would be like, I don't care. Like <laughs> that doesn't, that's not even relevant. Like, let me tell you, I'm right here. And I'm trying to go forward in the future. And this is what's relevant to me now. So if you want to talk to me about this and help me to move forward, great. But the, it's, I'm good on the past, you know? And that's like such a powerful thing that ketamine, because I just want to make this one observation. And I, this is just my opinion. But, uh, you know, usually when people are going to commit suicide, it's because they either think they have two choices. Keep doing what you're doing or kill yourself. That's it. And then they sit down in the doctor's office, they put on the blindfold, they get this super peaceful medical ketamine experience. And all of a sudden they're sitting there in present moment awareness, no future, no past. They're just right there in this beautiful calm place. And they look at their life and they see that it's just those two options. All of a sudden there's like 10 more options. And they're like, doing that, which could lead to that, which might even lead to that. Like, I'm not going to kill myself. This is so interesting. And so, you know, what else is going to do that? Nothing. Um, so we need to take advantage of this right now. And, you know, beginning of 2023, I would like to, you know, have, you know, 200 years from now that societies look back on us in this time and say, hey, those are the people that went back to nature in that moment, right then, you know, right when, right when after humans thought they were so smart and that technology could solve everything, 
that this is the group of people that went back to nature. That would be an amazing, I think, legacy for us. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty hopeful that's going to happen because, you know, like it or not, the psychedelics are coming out just like cannabis, but the impact that they have on mental health is so powerful. And somebody goes from being stuck to a, you know, proactive member of society and family and community that, uh, you know, you can't change that connections and things that's happening already. So we're in a good spot. Very well put. Yeah, psychedelics certainly have the, I mean, I feel like what you're, what you're explaining is like the observation of neuroplasticity in action. You know, we know the brain is capable of changing and rewiring itself given the proper stimulus. And psychedelics are such a powerful, potent stimulus, oftentimes in the right direction. And yeah, people are able to conceptualize their lives, their, their existence within the broader sphere of, you know, this whole thing in, in an entirely new way. So I feel like, you know, the, the awesome work that you're doing, the awesome work that everyone else in this, this space is doing and, and just bringing these, these compounds to more people to benefit is, is truly, you know, probably as, as you're saying, it's, we're going to look back at this time and it's going to be, you know, the return to nature, the return to psychedelics. It's, it's an awesome time to be here. Yeah. And I'll tell you one uh, note of urgency before uh, we wrap. Uh, the reason that I'm pounding the table so hard, not just, you know, going off and enjoying the fact that this is happening, is that I think we have a ticking clock right now uh, against us, which is that if you listen to Ray Kurzweil, the futurist, who was a top science officer at Google and a really amazing futurist, he predicted that in 2045, the year 2045, we will reach singularity where your brain will be attached to a chip with a chip connected to the internet with the entire cloud running over it with AI making calculations on what to do. And he said the average person with that setup in the year 2045 will be 1 billion times more intelligent than you are right now. So people are like, wow, that's so cool. But it's also really scary because that means any one of us has the ability to destroy everything. And we can't have a situation where somebody breaks up with their boyfriend, their girlfriend, whatnot. And then they're like, I'm going to destroy Miami today. And they do it. And so we have to raise consciousness now. We can't wait for 2044, which is not a long time from now. Uh, we need to do it now. We got to raise consciousness so we can handle that level of technology and power. Definitely so. Well, Zappy, we're, we're coming up onto the end of the show here. For listeners who want to connect with you or find out more about your work or the companies that you're involved in, where can you direct them? I would direct people onto social media. I'm Zappy, Z-A-P-P-Y, Zappolin, Z-A-P-O-L-I-N on social media. And check out mindarmy.org as well. Uh, join the Mind Army. We're, you know, again, we're, we're working to get Ibogaine, which is this addiction breaker. We want it descheduled because it is, a, uh, is, it is an opportunity to uh, combat the opiate epidemic right now. And so join that. And uh, yeah, just um, there's a lot of psychedelic conferences and things that are starting to happen this year, biotech and psychedelic cannabis related that uh, I plan to be part of it. So I look forward to meeting people that are here today and let me know where you've gotten. Check out Zappy Times, sign up and uh, love to share with you some of the really, you know, world class opportunities that I think are, you know, changing the world right now. So um, that's it. But thank you for having me. This is amazing. And I, I think the conversation that you're bringing forward and connecting these different uh, groups and constituents, it's a really important one right now. Absolutely. And, and we'll certainly include links to, to everything that you mentioned there in the show notes. And, and Zappy, I mean, I, I truly think this was, this was such an awesome uh, first episode, you know, to kick off the new podcast, uh, Evolution Psychiatry. I hope you listeners and viewers enjoyed this. Uh, you're going to be able to find this episode when it launches on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, most other major audio streaming platforms. And if you prefer to actually see the video, you can go ahead and check out the YouTube channel, which is going to be Evolution Psychiatry. 
So Zappy, again, thank you so, so much for taking the time out of your day to just share all your knowledge and expertise in, in psychedelics. I appreciate it. Thank you. Peace.